Well, my audience question tonight is very much in tune with what's going on in the House of Commons right now. Will the Rwanda bill work? Uh, it's a big question. Uh, clearly a lot's riding on it. We've got talk of Rishi Sunak's premiership once again being in jeopardy. Talk of a stalking horse candidate in Penny Morden. Again, the Tories have descended into a degree of psychodrama. Is the Rwanda plan the answer? I'd love to know from you if you think the Rwanda plan will actually rescue Rishi Sunak. How much do you care about the Rwanda plan? Do you need it to work? in order to vote for the Tories or have you given up on them? Do email farage at gbnews.com or tweet or indeed contact me on X with the hashtag Farage on GB News. Well, before we speak to Christopher Hope, who's in the Commons mopping up the atmosphere, let's bring in our guests now. Uh, we've got Paul Turner with me, who's an uh, immigration lawyer, and I've also got Dr Parth Patel with me, who's from the Institute for Public Policy Research. Let's turn to you first of all, Paul. Um, I mean, a lot is at stake here. It seems quite political, I think, the Rwanda plan in its entirety. If they do pass this legislation, we know there's ping pong going on between the Commons and the Lords. But say they do pass it. And we heard from Mark Harper, the Transport Secretary at the weekend, saying he hopes that flights will take off this spring. I mean, we're in the spring, but he's sort of suggesting it would be around May, June time. Will it work or will it just face constant legal challenge in the courts? Well, I think the, the major challenge that it, it faces, if it is um, passed and it's likely to be given the majority, is that um, the bill as it, set, uh, as it sets out does not exclude um, applications directly to the European Court of Human Rights. Ah. And there are two pretty clear avenues. One is uh, one up what's called Article 13, which is the right to an effective remedy. And the other one is the uh, underlying that the people will be badly treated um, when they get to Rwanda. And those are not excluded by the bill itself. So, yeah, uh, this was the problem that the right wingers had because they did want to exclude any sort of legal challenge by a foreign court, didn't they? We had those notwithstanding clauses that Bill Cash and others came up with. And I think the intention of that was to stop this sort of constant legal battle going on with the Home Office wanting to deport people and those people employing lawyers like yourself to say, no, you can't do it because you're breaching our European and other human rights. Yes, that's right. And, and, and there was an element of brinkmanship, which is and essentially uh, disavowing the ECHR in statute is essentially crossing the Rubicon and, and placing the United Kingdom out with international law. Mm, uh, although, didn't we say that we weren't going to abide by international law when it came to prisoner voter rights? I mean, we have turned around and said we will ignore a foreign court if we think our domestic legislation should chump it, trump it. And yet, at the same time, we get a lot on the left of the Tory parties sort of crying foul and saying it's going to be a, a reneging of our international obligations. But we have done it before. I think this is uh, the level of this potential... Uh, disavowing of, uh, of what is in fact uh, international law is going to put the United Kingdom in breach of quite a lot of conventions uh, and international treaties. And I'm sure a lot of the, the right-wingers would say that, that um, Parliament is sovereign, but it's sovereign that the UK is subject to international treaties and that there's an obligation on the UK mm. to act in good faith in respect of those international treaties. Yes. So to disavow them in statute in, in such a, an exceptional manner of what is really only a few hundred people. It, it is. Right, let's bring Dr Patel into the conversation here. Um, I mean, I think from the point of view of the GB audience, mm. if this is domestic legislation that gets passed through both houses, albeit it looks as if these amendments that have been tabled by the House of Lords will probably just be rejected by the Commons. So it, it, you could argue that the legislation is a compromise. They, the government hasn't kowtowed to all of the right wingers in the party. Actually, the left wingers have got, in a way, what they wanted, which is a bit more of a measured piece of legislation than some might have demanded. So this domestic legislation should stand, shouldn't it? It shouldn't be kiboshed by foreign courts. That's not really what domestic legislation's all about. If it's been passed through a House of Commons by MPs who are democratically elected by the British public. So there's, there's, there's a couple of things there. The first is is sort of the, the legitimacy of passing this legislation. And the second is <laughs> the left and right wing. I think I'm going to stick to the first for now. Mm. It's, it's important to say it's not a foreign court. It's a court we are part of. Sure. And I suppose when I'm saying foreign, I'm saying external to our domestic situation, external and not voted for in any way by the British public. And so, and so therefore, it's worth asking, why does it exist? Yes. Right. And in any democracy, people with power will abuse it. The, the, the 
purpose of our constitutional democracy to separate mm. where power lies mm. is exactly that. It's to stop the government abusing power, it's to stop parliament abusing power, and it's to stop the courts abusing power. But isn't power. this trying to stop smuggling gangs from abusing the law? The, well, the, the legislation is targeted as a deterrent to try and stop people on small boats coming to the United Kingdom. It's not criminalising smuggling gangs. That would be a different form of legislation. And it's worth thinking about why that business is booming. That's partly a result of British yes. government's policy regardless, right? Yeah. The question here about the courts is slightly different to the logic of the entire No, but policy. then you could say that the reason why we can't legislate to stop necessarily foreign smuggling gangs is because we can't have jurisdiction over lots of different countries. As far as people can tell, these smuggling gangs are a huge con criminal conglomerate of lots of people from lots of different countries across Europe. But so obviously that takes a kind of multinational approach. Approach. But what we're trying to do here is enforce domestic legislation that's representative of what the public wants. If you poll the public, the public wants illegal migration to stop and for the small boats to stop, doesn't it? Yeah, that, that's not quite the same as the rule, saying the Rwanda policy is popular with the public. It is categorically no, that's not true. popular. That's true. And okay. that's for various reasons. It's not just a legal problem. It's also just a, like so an emphatic, the, well, terrible let, value for money. OK, well, the value for money thing is a really good point because we now learn that it's going to cost 230000 per asylum seat. Uh, to send them to Rwanda, potentially, if you factor in all of the costs. I think it's a really good point, and we'll come back to that in just a moment, about, yeah, people want illegal migration to stop, but do they want the Rwanda plan per se? That seems to be a moot point. Let's bring Chopper into the conversation now. Christopher Hope, the political editor, is in the House of Parliament for us. Chopper, what's going on there? I mean, the timing of this keeps on flip-flopping. Um, we think there are going to be votes at 8 p.m. What's going to happen, do you think? That's right. And hi, and hi, hi, Camilla. That's right. There's going to be uh, 10 votes, 10 divisions of, of the House of Commons to overturn 10 different attempts by the House of Lords to weaken, if you're the government, or to improve, if you're the Lords, this Rwanda bill. And that they should all go through. We'll see Robert Buckland being one of the very, very few Tory MPs to vote against the government. It's on areas such as voting whether uh, Rwanda um, is, needs to be called a safe country before the first uh, flights can take off. Um, it's other issues um, around whether um, people coming here from allied countries can be sent to Rwanda or their own country they come from. There's 10 different areas, all quite technical, but it's quite important the government, they seem to be strong and getting them, out, getting them uh, re reversed. We heard today from number 10 how they are now looking at what they call a cohort of illegally arrived um, asylum seekers. Uh, they will get letters contacted and told they'll be on the first flights. Those first flights, they are subject to challenges in the courts. Every one of those cases, I imagine, will find a lawyer. There will then be a, a battle through the courts despite what Parliament has, happened, uh, has, has passed um, this week. Uh, we mm. are expecting the Commons to win today and it goes back to the Lords on, on Wednesday. So at the beginning of a process, which could be the end of this, this uh, two, nearly two-year wait for the Rwanda plan to become law. Um, Chris, how much is riding on this for Rishi Sunak? Obviously, today we've read all of the reports about Penny Mordaunt. His leadership is once again being called into question. We've had yet more catastrophic polling in the weekend papers suggesting that the Tories are heading for some kind of electoral oblivion. Um, clearly, this is one of his pledges in his five-point plan, so it's important. But is this really going to be what changes the dial, what moves the dial for people to go back to the Tories, do you think? Well, Camilla, it might do. I think that will only happen when these flights finally take off. We've heard from Labour today how they would drop the Rwanda plan, even if it's working. So whether, uh, it, whether that's enough to make it, happen, make it work, we, we're not sure. I think there's a lot to be decided for Rishi Sunak. I think he is in some danger tonight. Um, I didn't think I'd be saying this, but it looks like the Tories could be looking at a third attempt at regicide uh, in a little under four or four and a half years. Um, I've been told by a very senior Tory uh, tonight that there could be a move against Mr Sunak as soon as this week. That could happen in two different ways. Um, whether Sir Graham Brady leaves a group of senior Tories to go and see Mr Sunak and tell him that, that you've got to change course or do something dramatic or it's all over. Um, that others are saying that the number of 53, this number of no comment letters, could be, could be tripped over by mistake. As many as 40 yes. have gone in already to Sir Graham Brady, I've been told by two, two senior sources. Another six went in over the 
weekend in the wake of Lee Anderson defecting, of course, and then that, the row over the comments by the donor about Diane Abbott. Um, he is in some danger tonight. The odds of, of um, Penny Mordaunt becoming leader have been slashed by major bookmakers. Um, people look at her and think, well, is she the answer? But for many on the right, she's a blank canvas, a bit like Theresa May. No one what, knows what she really thinks about some key Tory areas. Yes. But she is someone who the Labour Party fears the most, I think. And I think that right now, this is a massive week for Richard Sunak, unexpectedly. He's seeing the Party 22 on Wednesday. Uh, there should be some better economic news. But I think people are defecting and moving away from him. The herd is moving away from the PM yes. as we speak. And he's got to do something this week to reassure them. Thank you very much indeed, Christopher Hope, who's in the House of Commons watching that vote for us and will be updating us uh, later on this evening. Um, I mean, my God, a third... <laughs> third act of regicide for the Tory party in as many years. Um, I'm not sure whether these people are, I, I don't know, completely deranged or just desperate. Uh, Dr Patel, the cost of this plan is probably what's putting the public off it, do you think? I don't think that's what's putting the public off it. I think the absurdity is probably what puts the right. public off it. But the cost is kind of mind-blowing. It's exceptionally poor value for money. And that's at the best of times. So the current, these times where we don't even know if we can see a doctor or a copper in an hour of need. Yeah. It's just... I mean, there was a question mark in people's minds when the country was Rwanda. Subsequently, to be fair, some European nations, even the EU itself, has talked about processing in a third party country, mm -hmm. but not necessarily one with a history of genocide. Mm -hmm. um, that 230 grand per asylum seeker, how does that compare with how they're processed now? If you didn't send one to Rwanda, how much would it cost comparatively? It's four times as expensive. Right. OK. Paul Turner, your reaction, first of all, to the cost, but also... We heard from Christopher Hope there talking about even if the legislation is passed, it can still be subject to multiple legal challenges. That's your interpretation too, right? Yes, uh, and the law provides that, that, that legal challenges are open to people. Um, and I would imagine that most people would avail themselves of those legal challenges perfectly as they're perfectly entitled to. Yeah. Um, I mean, as an immigration lawyer, you're looking at the Rwanda bill about to be passed, rubbing your hands together with glee, thinking to yourself, well, I'm going to have another busy year. Uh, Sadly not. Um, it's not an area that I particularly specialise in, um, but I feel more for the individuals that are caught up in this because they're threatened with this removal to Rwanda, which doesn't take place. They live under a huge amount of uncertainty, which I do see with my clients on a, a, for a, a, the human face of people yeah. who are seeking to regularise their status or have suffered um, through poverty. Um, and I feel sorry, more sorry for them, really, and also the taxpayer. I mean, uh, as Dr Patel picked up, uh, the total cost of this, it's four times as much to process somebody in Rwanda. But that's essentially, a, uh, to use the term, a bung to the Rwandan mm. government per person. Yeah. That's an exception to the 500 million they're going to get. OK. Paul Turner, Path Patel, thank you very much indeed for joining me this evening.